good to see everybody. And um, as a lot of you know, I'm Mike Conti. I work with the Overture Group. Uh, I actually have the great pleasure to work with our speaker today, Linda. Um, I'll give you a, a quick intro on her in a minute and then let her tell you more about what she does. Um, like I said before that, we'll go through some some items. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Susan for everything she does uh, and then all the people on the CMG committee um, with Kathy and myself. Um, I won't list everyone, but a number of people on this call and, and uh, have been with us, you know, been on it for, for a long time. This uh, CMG session, uh, you're eligible for a one, one CPE credits. Uh, you have to be uh, you have to, to be on the, the presentation the entire time, and then you have to request it uh, from Susan right after the presentation. She'll send out an email, uh, so be on the lookout, you know, info at feichicago.org, um, and if you respond to that and request CPE and you're on the class the, the whole time, um, you'll get it. Um, there's also evaluations that will come out. It's really helpful if you fill those out, give us feedback. Um, and help us, you know, provide good content uh, for you in the future. I want to talk a little bit about membership. There's a bunch of, I think, as far as uh, reasons to join, um, including networking with key influencers, uh, understanding what's uh, emerging issues, uh, being an advocate for corporate finance, and then helping your own career. Um, and I'd also like to specifically highlight that right now, there's a six-month uh, free trial. So, if anyone is not a member and on this call, uh, definitely take advantage of that. Uh, and then if you know any people, any colleagues, um, other finance leaders, uh, you know, encourage them to join while it's free. Um, so, yeah. So with that, uh, Susan, I think we should I could get Linda introed. And um, afterwards, I have some other announcements for future events, um, including an in-person one. Um, so I'll leave that as my teaser. So you guys have to stay on and wait for those. <laughs> so, um, okay. With that being said, uh, I'd like to introduce Linda. Uh, so Linda is one of our compensation consultants. Um, she does not low key and humble and does not like to be mentioned, but she has a law degree, an MBA. Uh, she's a certified compensation professional. She's got a whole list of, of bona fides that she won't mention. So I will just give the, just, just mention that. Um, and then she works with uh, various executives and companies on compensation strategies. She specializes in developing um, market competitive compensation strategies for employees, executives, uh, sales force, um, and incentive plan design. Um, pretty much anything compensation related that helps attract or retain uh, the best talents uh, Linda is involved in, and I will kick it off to her to explain a little bit further. Because I, I just so you know, I so I work with the Overture Group, and I constantly say we're an executive search and compensation consulting firm, and then probably give you my thirty-second commercial on executive search because it's what I do, and Linda can, uh, you know, she is what she is the other side of that, and uh, working on the compensation. Uh, consulting team and does great work with my clients. Uh, I just don't always do a good job of explaining what she does. So, <laughs> Linda, with that, I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you for that introduction and thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, great to be here. I, um, as Mike said, he, he did a great, I think, overview of what we do do in the compensation practice of the Overture Group. And it's really a broad spectrum of designing programs for different constituents within the organization. So that means sometimes working with boards of directors to design executive, CEO, pay, long-term incentive plans, annual incentive plans. And, and some of that is the topic of our program here today, uh, like what's going on with long-term, short-term incentives. We also do broad-based compensation studies. And right now with turnover being slightly higher than normal due to the pandemic and the um, inflation and the, you know, all of the benefits we've had given to us, you all know too well, many companies are in a real tizzy right now and, and not sure what to do to really retain employees. And, and they call us, what can we do? What can we do, you know, to attract and retain better than we have been? So 
So those areas are of, of most importance right now, I think, in our marketplace. So they're really at a high level. That's kind of what we do. Happy to chat with any of you um, after the call if you have any more specific needs or questions or just want some advice on what to do in your situation. Happy to happy to help you all always. Okay, so we're going to cover three broad areas, pay and labor trends, and then incentive plans on the short-term side, meaning annual, usually they're referred to as, and then on the long-term, meaning plans that are more than one year in length. And throughout, I'm going to have a couple poll questions to keep it lively and interactive. And as Mike said, please jump in with questions because I want to make this as conversational as possible if you have any. So first, as far as salary increase, you know, trends, what's going on. Um, typical, as has been for many years now, we're running at about a 3% median increase in overall pay increases. So that includes if you lump together the merit, if people have general increases or whatever type of pay adjustments they provide annually to their employees. So this is the overall average. And I look at the medians. I have the median circled because the means, um, you know, the simple average are more of a, uh, they, they tend to draw out the extremes. And that's why as compensation people, we like to look at the median, the exact middle point of the data set. So, um, that's what we generally do. And you'll see the trend here in 2020, it was 3.0, 2021 has been 3.0. And again, for next year, it's 3.0. And uh, this was conducted in the summer. And this particular survey is one of the, the largest that are conducted in our, in our country. So it's a highly respected data source, but I have a couple others because I always like to look at more than one data source because they're all sample sizes and we have no one consensus or census of the every data point, every company. So some people look at this and say, this seems low given what's going on out there in the market, which is one of the reasons one of my poll questions in a few minutes is about what are your companies doing? Are you going to, you know, what is that average increase you're planning to spend next year? So here's just another source. Uh, this one is Corn Fury. The other one was World at Work. Um, I like this one because it not only shows the median, but it shows the percentiles. And you can see, uh, let me get my little mouse here, uh, 3% you know, for executives is the median, as in the other survey. But I like to see the, 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 the 90th percentile, for example, is 3.3. So it's not even, say, five or four. Again, merit budgets have been so small because the trend of inflation over the past several years has been pretty minimal. Now, right now, the last few months, we've kind of really ratcheted up. So everyone's like, okay, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? But honestly, no, none of us know. So on the, on the low end of these percentiles, you can see it's down to 2.4. And these are of companies who are giving pay increases. Last year with COVID, many companies froze pay, some reduced pay. And I have a slide a little later to talk about that. But so these are companies are going to give an increase. This is what's going on typically. Okay. And so for, for next year, this is what is planned. And this just shows a trend over time, what pay increases have been. And it goes back to the late 90s. So you can see the economic downturn, the dot-com crash in 2001, and you can see our big crash in 2008, 2009, we all remember. And then currently, so you can see the spikes and everything. And it's not on here, but the salary increases generally uh, follow or lag inflation. So they generally run somewhat below inflation. Um, now, given this, again, this hyper inflation point we're in, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next six months. So, Linda, so let's go ahead. Go ahead. Do you, with you saying that, um, I have another question. But my question is, then do you think that because inflation and when numbers are released, you know, that's more recent. If those surveys were from the summer, right, the actual inflation data is coming out now. 
do you think that means that there's a likelihood if it follows that trend of coming, you know, adjusting after inflation, that there will be a sizable sort of shift or increase to, to make up for that inflation? Well, here's the thing. Well, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> On a large scale, I don't see that happening. I think from talking with other leaders and, and what's going on, I think it depends on a few factors. One, the size of your company. You know, um, I think the bigger companies have already locked in or set their budgets and they start in the summer months planning them. If any of you are at really big companies, you know that. I think the smaller companies might still be finalizing budgets and maybe some of the larger ones I can remember working at Sears and us not getting them done until January or February, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But anyway, sometimes that just happens. So I think that the 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 pay increase is, is going to be locked in and it's going to depend on what a company can afford to do as well. Affordability is big. And so what I think is going to happen is there may be dollars earmarked and maybe goodwill or, you know, or something, but for off cycle pay adjustments for your high skilled, high in demand functions, jobs, people, you know, key people you need to retain. Because I don't think that we're going to be able to afford as, a, as an economy, all companies to just say, okay, economies, if inflation's at five or 6%. Okay, now we're going to give another 4% or 5%. And you're, that usually lags and, and doesn't happen quickly. So if you look at um, over the years, how it's moved, it, it, it moves slowly, the merit budgets. So that, that would be my prediction. Um, I think the smaller companies might be impacted more so. Um, again, it's, it's about affordability. It's about, okay, how can you pay for this? Are you going to pass it on to customers? Are you going to reduce headcount? Uh, you know, are you going to reduce the incentive plan uh, uh, target amounts to be paid? So we'll, while we're going through this uncertain time, I think there's a few levers we can pull as companies, but I think each one's going to be dependent specifically on the company situation. Do you, for entry level people, have you seen any, um, have you seen companies make adjustments just to address labor shortages or minimum wage increases? Has that affected the data on, on entry level people? That's a huge, huge area of concern. And, um, we're in Chicago, and I'm going to. I have sliding in here about minimum wage, actually. In the change, well, you could, changes. If, you're, if you're going to get to it later, that's fine too. I just, just yeah, let's know. talk about minimum wage in a minute. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and while we're on this topic of pay increases, I'm curious what your company is planning for your pay increases this year for 2022. The to the people who said more than 3.5, I'm just curious. What what would you mind sharing? What that amount is. Yeah, this is Sharon. So we just proposed a budget of 4%. And uh, we're looking at giving an average of 6% to those earning less than 45,000 and three and a quarter to everybody else. You know, we haven't, you know, put the whole plan in place. Um, and of course, we have to work with HR on that, but um, that the CEO and I have discussed this. Because I think, the, to be honest with you, those entry-level salaries, you know, I asked HR to, to do a market on those entry-level salaries in our call center. And HR came back to me and said, yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're paying at market, but we've been paying the same amount for three years. And I went back to her and said, is that a living wage? I mean, come on. You know, right. the reason we're in this situation is because of people like us. So I think we need to be more cognizant of, you know, the life of the people at the bottom. Right. Uh, there's a, thanks for that. And there's a response of 4% uh, in the chat. And then this is anecdotal, but uh, I was at a breakfast with a partner from a, uh, one of the larger CPA firms. And he said they're going to do, I'm not going to use the firm because I'm now going to be, I think it was 14% or so increase for all staff. Um, 
and and a, you know that's an industry that loses people fast. It needs them. So so uh, it could be an outlier, but it also sets the market for a lot of professional level accounting finance uh, individuals. So. Yeah, I have a similar story for public accounting firm. I have a niece who got it. She's gotten about twenty over the last two years, about a twenty five percent raise. And she was just offered a to stay bonus for basically about 18 months, 35,000 at the top end. Yeah. So then we had uh, another answer in the chat um, that their their like their warehouse associates are going from 15 to 17, which is a 13 percent increase. And then that's similar for their starting college graduates. Got it. Thank you, everyone, for the sharing those data points. This is Steve. Uh, in, in PR and advertising, we're you know three to five percent. So um, high high turnover, high attrition right now. The uh, job market's very competitive. We have done market adjustments to retain employees that are significantly higher than that, uh, and we're just trying to hold folks on board by providing them uh, a, a decent pay increase. Right. Okay. Again, very. Uh, I love this. Uh, these, this information, this is very helpful. Um, one thing to keep in mind is when you're hearing these big numbers being thrown around, keep in mind some of this depends on, to the point made earlier, are we already at market? If you're not at market overall on an average basis, you know, if you think about employee pay, you're going to have usually along the continuum kind of a bell curve. Some are paid low, some are paid medium, some are paid high, and most are in the middle and fewer are on the ends in terms of are we at market, are we below or above market? Kind of goes back to that whole thought of what's your compensation philosophy? The majority of companies want to pay at market. Some want to pay above market, like technology clients I have. Okay, we want to pay at the 75th, okay. That's not unusual for technology because of that high professional skill set that has you know high in demand because those uh, tools, software, it's, they're always changing and evolving. So getting that new fresh talent that has the high skills. On the other continuum, if you're in a minimum pay kind of market or even a low skilled market, for example, truck drivers, one of my clients is a transportation company. We have done so many refreshes of market data for those drivers, CDLA. Oh my God, it's like crazy. These markets just going up so fast because of the labor shortages. And it's true, it's out there. But you're always going to have people paid below and always going to have people above. And, you know, I think that what we're going through right now is a general economy. It it brings more attention to that. So I think it's a good reason to take pause and look at overall your pay programs, are they generally market competitive or not? And this whole concept of the labor shortage, in my opinion, is never going to go away because, and I have some slides in here in a minute about the labor force and, you know, supply and demand, how our labor force is growing and and slowing down in growth. And we've known for a long time this was coming for different reasons, which I'll get into. So this is this is becoming such a more important topic than maybe it even was five years ago, even though companies say they're market competitive and they're doing the right thing. There's always room for improvement, but always room to look at and, and maximize and optimize how your programs are designed, not just the pay salary itself. There's a lot of other components to go into attracting and retaining. And I, again, got a slide on that. So I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but um Thanks. This is very interesting. Uh, good results. So let's go can back I, to the presentation. Can I make Can I make one comment? Maybe you can tie it sure. into the labor force discussion when you get into the labor shortage. Um, our experience, um, like others, is that you know during COVID, we were you know market competitive or above. People were thankful to have jobs. We paid a, a premium to our hourly workers that had to work during COVID when we mandated it as a manufacturing company, and people were very thankful. And in a very short time, that swung to where we're being outbid for people looking for, you know, labor. Um, and when you look at hourly workforce, I mean, we're talking about maybe, you know, just adding a dollar per hour, for instance, right? For a typical manufacturing wage, that's almost 5%, give or take. And and so the, the 3 to 4% seem low, like we're having to pay 
very quickly higher than what we thought was market just six months ago, right? It seems like the, the, the data is lagging, right? The data just hasn't caught up to what we're experiencing from the data you're showing. It seems like the, you know, I was talking with other people that, that, that I work, other associates and other businesses. I mean, people are now competing with, you know, Amazon warehouses, Mm-hmm. And anywhere that you've got one of those, it's it's resetting labor wages in those markets. It may not be national, maybe very focused regionally or by location, but we're not thinking in terms of of percents right now. We're thinking in terms of one or two dollar shifts. Right. And for a lot of you know salary levers, that's five to ten percent. Right. And then at right. the more senior levels, it may not be the base merit increase you're seeing. But our turnover has spiked up, as everybody else's has, as people, you know, look to do something else, and the labor shortage is tightened, and the market rates that we're seeing for people coming in is significantly higher than the people we had. And I don't know how that's captured in the global inflationary wage data, but for a company, it's 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 resetting price points for jobs as we bring people in. Do, do those two things make sense? Absolutely. That that absolutely goes on, and. Again, think about your employee group on average. A lot of times you've got a lot of people paid lower than market. A lot of companies say they want to be market payers on average, but the most of my clients are below market, meaning they're paying people at the 25th percentile, not the 50th or the 20th. So that, that driver client I mentioned, they were paying people far below the median, most of them below the 25th. So just the comment you just made, throwing one and two dollar, three in high labor markets, uh, dollar increases at these drivers to retain them. And you're right, they're bringing people in higher. So they're going back and say, okay, now we have to adjust internally our people who are here. Maybe we look at the performance, how long they've been here, other factors to try to objectively give them a bump as well. Many companies are doing that, you know, giving the existing staff more money, which is not part of your traditional annual pay increase budget. So again, there's a number of ripple effects going on related to pay right now. Um, But yes, that's absolutely going on. When you you hear someone say, we're given a 15% increase or something, I, I, I warn people not to overreact by media. Um, You're always going to have data points high and low, but you don't know all the time, like if if a person's getting 15%, where were they before? Were they really below market? Boy, they really needed to come up, you know? So it's good to look at the bigger picture as much as possible. And your point about competing with Amazon or something. And I've worked in call center environments when I was in corporate America. Oh my God, Amazon comes to town, boom, (laughs) you know? they totally upset the work for the labor market, especially in rural markets. And so you you really have to be on the ball, know who your local competitors are, especially for those lower skilled minimum wage type jobs. And and it's a reality. It's tough, tough to compete with Amazon and people usually get burned out there. That's why they leave, you know, the money's great, but, you know, but anyway, I don't want to get on a rant about Amazon. I, you know, Amazon's a great company. So let's move on from this slide. I just want to make sure we get through everything. Okay, so speaking of minimum wage, I put this in here because of one reason and one reason only. Sure, you guys heard a lot in the news about Chicago's minimum wage. And uh, what's not in the news so much, or honestly, I didn't hear at all, is what I have underlined here, that when Chicago went to $15 an hour, and this was put into effect a couple of years ago, right? That they were going to get up to 15. They put in that it will be looked at going forward on an annual basis. And in the past, it wasn't that way, right? Before this dollar an hour bump, you know, in different states and cities happened, it was looked at several years apart, right? We didn't have an annual tick up in minimum wage. Going forward in Chicago and other markets, Chicago is not the only one doing this, they will now look at inflation. And if inflation is going up, 
they will adjust the minimum wage every year on July 1 based on the CPI up to 2.5% each year. So the way we're tracking right now with inflation <laughs> looks like we're going to have another bump next year. So this is forever, you know, into perpetuity. So especially as finance people, if you weren't aware of this, you might want to just check that off because, you know, that could be a factor in your budgeting going forward. So just wanted to share that quick. So at the other end of the spectrum, the minimum wage to the high earners, this is just a quick snapshot of CFO pay from one of our sources. And with pretty much every job, especially as you get into higher level, mid-level, mid-career and up jobs, the size of the company generally dictates the pay level. Sometimes the industry does as well, but most of all, it's the size company because the jobs are more complex. Um, if it's public, it's even more high because of, say, your function as CFOs, you need to understand all of the SEC reporting requirements and, and all the other compliance that goes along that some public, uh, private companies don't have to comply with, although some may do anyway. Um, so you can see on the low end here, 10 million and up, we have a salary of roughly two and a quarter. And then all the way on the right side, uh, greater than 50 billion in revenues, your salary is over 600, right? And then if you combine together your short-term incentive, which is in red, and the long-term incentive in green, you've got some really big dollars, you know, again, on the small end, less than 10 million, about a little under 500,000 uh, a year, factoring in all three of those. And then at the high end, over one and a half um, million. So so there's, you guys are in a great profession and uh, it speaks for itself when you, when you look at the pay levels. So um, just wanted to share that. I realized that um, some companies are below 10 million. This particular survey doesn't show data for companies smaller than that. I have some other surveys. So if you're in a company smaller than that and you want to know what that would be, I'm happy to share that with you. So just reach out uh, offline and I'd be happy to share that. So talking a little about the labor growth that we touched on earlier, this should be no surprise to anyone that for years we've been told uh, that our growth rate slowing down, right? So this is the U.S. growth rate in the predictions. And you can see um, our population has been going up very steadily, rapidly here. That's the blue line. And right now we're at about 332 million people. On the other hand, our growth rate starting from back in 1950 is going down. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, we're still positive, right? We're still above zero. So we're still having more people be born than are dying. <laughs> so that's good news. Um, but in the long term, it's really getting down there pretty darn low. So what does this mean? It means on a longer term, we're going to need to rely more on immigrants. Okay. And you can see the shift. And this is, you know, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, our tax dollars funding this agency uh, to, to gather all of this information and predict it. So, we can see that this this darker line um, is our is our uh, population change, where at the what they call resident population, where they refer to as immigrant population, is the top blue line. So as the time goes on, and it's worth the interesting crossroads here, where that immigration line is starting to tick up beyond our natural population of residents. So we're, we're, we're living in very interesting times. And this is one of the reasons I say the whole uh, concept of our labor force and supply and demand and you know, finding talent is not gonna go away. And, and they've been saying it for years, you know, 
baby boomers are retiring, people are having fewer children. Well, it's here. It's it's arrived before today, but with COVID encouraging earlier retirements than maybe would have naturally occurred and other factors, we're, we're living this and I really don't see it going away. So those dynamics are something that as business leaders, we need to keep top of mind and think more strategically than ever about talent, human capital, and what do we do to make sure we're being the most effective we can be? It's more important than ever, I believe. So this slide shows something that came out after COVID occurred, again, from the uh, Labor Department. What they envision over the next 10 years with 2020 as the baseline, how are job categories going to recover after COVID? And the blue bars are meaning it's going to have a full recovery from COVID. The yellow means additional growth, okay? So new growth. So for example, personal care and services is going to just recover, probably not grow from where it was before, right? But nonetheless, these are high growth areas, okay? More than 20%. And then as you skew down, and and by the way, I don't think anyone's surprised to see this. This is kind of been healthcare, 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 right? Um, So this is not a surprise. What to me is a surprise or a learning um, is these bottom ones. You know, with COVID, this whole office administration support with, with the shift to remote, it makes sense. It's logical if you think about it, has really reduce the need for that kind of support. In person, if companies are working now remotely, you don't need that office space, you don't need the people at the front desk to answer the phone. You know, everyone's with with our technology tools, more and more people are doing things on their own. They don't need the level of support they did in the past. So that, that makes sense. What I find most interesting is the sales roles. And in talking with some sales leaders and CEOs, they've told me they've seen this coming. They've seen it coming for years but COVID really accentuated it even more. Again, because of the nature of people working remotely. And that is because of increased technologies over the years, recent years, the sale, the nature of the sale has changed dramatically. So people, look at cars. People even are buying cars today online and they get delivered to your home. So going to the car dealer isn't always necessary. So all types of sales in many industries are changing. So it's not so much a relationship per, you know, in person sale in relationship management that maybe was big before. And, you know, like in my line of work, it's huge, right? Um, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever get to a point with compensation consulting, just push a button and get, you know, <laughs> but it's very, ours is really an art and a science. So that's why in, I don't think we could ever just push a button on compensation consulting, but who knows? <laughs> but but anyway, so the sales profession is markedly changing, and and to me that's just fascinating because that's what that's what drives a company's you know it's the blood of the company you know selling selling products or services or whatever the business is in, and then production again I think that's no surprise although. Because of COVID, and again, I don't know how that's going to change. Obviously, none of us really do till it happens, but that more business is coming back to the U.S. for manufacturing. I hear that from pretty much most people I ask that question of. Um, So anyway, uh, related to turnover, this study conducted by Pearl Meyer, an executive um, compensation firm, asked their clients about turnover and about half said it's more than normal and almost 40 percent said it's it's okay it really hasn't changed but it's challenging so again I think we hear in the media everybody's having turnover everyone 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 and it's not everyone it's so I think we just this is I just put this into show perspective many are 
but it's probably in pockets of jobs. I don't think it's every job in every company. And it also depends on what I said earlier, where are you starting from? Were you already market competitive? Those that aren't are the most at risk, right? And people don't always move because of pay. Sometimes it's something else. Oftentimes it's something else. Uh, and that's why doing employee surveys and, and satisfaction and engagement surveys are so important. Linda, is there a particular, um, somebody asked, is there turnover in the lower pay grades or do you have data on, on where that turnover is? Um, or is that, you know, just, just I know that with that graph was just general turnover. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have not seen numbers in a survey on that, but it would be interesting to see. My gut tells me it's probably at it, 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 the ends. So the people who are older, I think it's bumping them into retirement earlier and then, and then the entry, which more people generally leave because of pay when you're talking at the minimum wage jobs. That would be my gut. I could be wrong, but I've never seen the survey. That's a great question though. Um, so this is just high level, what companies have been doing uh, based on COVID. And you've probably heard all this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Off-cycle salary adjustments, um, adjusting the base salary uh, ranges, if you use ranges, and uh, you know, s- sign-on bonuses, if you haven't already been doing that. So those are the most common things, which, again, you probably have read about. Um, I put this slide in here because a minute ago I talked about it's not all about pay and attracting and retaining is about a lot of things. And if you're not already doing it, you might want to create some strategies around selling your total compensation when you're attracting talent and retaining it. The value of the medical insurance alone is huge. And this shows what companies are paying today for medical coverage. This slide is actually for family coverage, but the company is paying over $16,000 a year. That's huge for family coverage, whereas the employee is paying $5,900. And you can see from left to right how that's trended over the last 10 years. So, you know, medical inflation has always exceeded general inflation. For <laughs> I could have a whole presentation just on that slide. Um, but moving right along, let's do the next poll question about what your organizations have done or are considering doing um, to attract or retain um, related to pay. Okay, so this is great news because it tells me that the majority of your companies are getting back on your feet after COVID. And it's, it's really an industry, I think, by industry that they're struggling or not at this point. So this is great news that the majority are not taking other actions. Uh, So let's just keep going right along here. Let's talk a little bit about annual incentives. And I know we have about 15 minutes left, so I want to move through this a little quicker. And this is really more just informational. I don't need to spend a lot of time on these. Just wanted to give you an overview of the latest design elements of these programs and what's going on with payouts at a high level. So... um, Regarding short-term incentives for executives, uh, this year, there's really no changes, as you can see, more than half of the companies reported. Last year, with COVID, we saw a lot. We saw uh, new plans being put in. We saw goals being lowered. We saw discretion being added to the payout. So this year, things are stabilizing, so more than half do nothing. So that's that's good news. Uh, in terms of what companies are projecting as year-end bonus payouts for this year, um, good news again, if you combine um, those at Target, expecting a Target payout, so 100% of their Target, assuming they have a Target, uh, they're expecting to pay that out 24%, and then 35% are expected to pay even higher than that. So um, I like to think of maybe plus or minus 10% from Target is really Target itself. But this this is a big group, 150. I, 
I would suspect not a lot are at the 150, but nonetheless, for purposes of the survey, you can see if you add together that 60%. So more than half of the companies, well, plus if you add greater than 150%, more than half the companies are back to paying out bonuses at target, le target levels, which is great news. What we don't know is the stretch in those budget, those goals, right? But but anyway, this is kind of what we see as a normal um, payout. So you always have people achieving, you always have people exceeding, and you always have people not achieving. And this slide actually has the long term in there as well. You can see. Um, and so, this is changes that they're planning to make at the end of this year. Only put this in to compare from last year. Again, these numbers were much, much higher, like positive discretion, like bumping up the payout versus what the results actually said was probably one of the highest, maybe 50% of companies doing that if they didn't take another action like resetting goals because um, they still wanted to have payouts. Some, not everybody, those that could afford to. So here's what um, is generally paid out again, from a design perspective, if at your threshold, so most plans that are uh, objectively uh, designed versus a discretionary plan, you have a threshold, a target payout, and a maximum payout. This is just showing what they pay out, for example, at the minimum. So if you hit the threshold performance, the, the majority of companies, meaning the most, I should say the mode, are... Um, 50% payouts. So half of your target is paid out if you hit threshold. On the other end of the scale, at the top, if you hit um, the maximum, you get paid double of what that target would have been. And that is pretty standard. That's been probably a norm for a while. But again, it's not necessarily there's one right answer. It's what's right for your organization and your situation. As far as metrics, um, from a, a measure standpoint, operating income is the most popular along with revenue. So those two, you can see, are the most predominantly used. Again, depending on your industry or where your, your company is in, in the business cycle, another measure may make sense. There may be an industry norm for your type of industry. So again, no one right answer. Some companies use not only a financial, these are all financial measures, but about half use an operational measure. Uh, fewer use individual goals, um, depending on the situation. Okay, so we don't know because we don't know if it's one or two or three that they didn't ask that in this question. The point is that some use operational and even fewer use, say, an individual goal. And now... Uh, Yes. Do you have a percentage of companies that um, use sh uh, short-term incentive plans and then a percentage that use long-term incentive plans? It's a great question. It really depends on the size of the company. Larger companies tend to use annual incentive plans. Um, smaller may or may not have them but I don't have an exact percentage. And I think you're going to find variance in the surveys you look at because there is no one right answer. Long-term incentive plans are much less common. Again, though, as you get bigger, you're going to probably have a long-term incentive plan, at least especially for your executives. And that is one of the things the Overture Group does. Our company focuses on the very, very small market employers. So most of the work we do has to do with creating long-term incentives for like two or three or maybe five participants, your key leaders, who they don't have them already. So it really depends on the size of your company. But no, I don't have exact percents. Okay, you know, if you go into the tech industry, for example, almost all will have an incentive plan, a short-term plan, and they will all be, everyone will be in the plan. It's very likely, too, they might have a long-term incentive plan and everyone's in the plan. You know, it, it depends Industry on affordability, size, competition. Yeah. Uh, what are they doing? What do you need to do to compete against those players? And then what can you afford? Thank you. Okay, just real quickly on long-term incentives. Um, most typically, 
if you do have a long-term incentive plan, these plans uh, vest over you know multiple years, and I have a slide on that in a second. Um, but the goal you set is is really, I think, the backbone of the plan. And in this slide, it shows the majority of companies, ninety percent, are using a multiple-year cumulative goal. So that means take year one. Uh, take your two, take your three, those three annual goals, add them together. And that's your one single goal, a cumulative goal versus the other examples below that are using, say, one-year goals. If you use a one-year goal, it's not really a long-term incentive, you know, and that's that's why this number is up at 90, because a true long-term incentive plan, you're looking at long-term performance of a company. That's why it's a long-term plan. Um, and that's why they look at a long-term measure. So the idea is to keep these participants, usually senior management are the participants, um, keep them focused on long-term growth of the company. You know, that's what they do. They talk about long-term vision, long-term strategy. What are we going to do five, 10 years out? Not what are we going to do next year? I mean, you're sure they do what are we going to do next year? but it's their job to kind of look more longer term. Um, this slide is interesting for showing the differences between public and privately held companies. Privately held could be family, PE, um, ESOP, you know, it could be any kind of um, company. If you're public, you're most likely to use, um, First of all, real equity or shares of stock that's publicly traded on the whatever market um, based on performance is 50% of that. And then a combination also using, they call it time-based, which means you can still get this. You just have to show up. <laughs> you have to stay employed. So this became more popular probably 10 to 15 years ago when companies moved away from stock options and put more, say, restricted stock in, which means you just get that um, as long as you stay employed. And as more and more companies started doing that, it became almost a norm to, to have it in order to compete for talent. So that's what time-based equity is. So you're still getting shares of stock. It's just not based. It doesn't have to be based on a company hitting a certain goal. And then they still use some stock options. So that's a public company. Um, private, on the other hand, though, you can see they use much a much different mix. So there's less equity, but it's privately held equity, meaning the shares are traded slimly. You might be on a private, like a pink sheet. Or you're not on a general exchange like a, a New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. You're on um, a different exchange, or it could just be a, a, an equity like, like a synthetic equity, um, meaning it's cash. It, it's not really um, it's actual shares. And then again, so part of its time, much smaller pace on performance. Some, uh, some use time-based, some use stock options. Again, um, like the equity one, it's either thinly traded or um, really a cash type program. And then a cash LTIP is basically a long-term incentive plan like the annual incentive plan, just putting in those cumulative goals. And then finally, a phantom stock plan, which is very, very similar to um, these other equity type programs. And then this is just showing like direct reports of the CEO. So these numbers are very similar to the CEO. So I won't go into those because... So that's just the mix that's that's commonly used. And then uh, as far as the, go ahead. We have a, I know, just give a quick five minute warning and then a quick apology. I know there are questions. Um, I just know with five minutes that it'd probably be hard to get to those. Um, so I just want to apologize to the audience for that and then just give you that warning. So, or let me know what you want me to do in the next the sure. last five. Minutes. Yeah, I think I'm almost done actually. Well, we have a few. These aren't really too critical, but um, so if we don't get through all the questions, if you want to email them to me, I'm happy to respond and you can maybe send them out to the participants um, or people can reach out to me too. I have my contact information on the last slide. I'm, I'm assuming you guys will send the deck out to the participants, Mike. 
Yep, if you're good with okay. it, we definitely yeah, can. Yeah. So yeah, this Linda, is, if you could send me the deck right after this, I'll get it out to everyone. Yeah, I didn't do Thank that you. yet, did I? I'm sorry. Okay, so the so who's in the Ultra? Again, it depends. It depends on your philosophy. It depends on maybe who you compete with as an industry or a company. Um, so, so that can vary, and it does vary. That's why compensation I refer to as when I teach, I ask my students, what color is compensation? And they always say red or green logical answers, but I say the right answer is gray <laughs> because compensation is black numbers. It's a lot about numbers, but it's also an equal amount of judgment, you know, and really in most cases, unless you're talking like minimum wage, there's not one right answer. So it can be a lot of answers, <laughs> but anyway, back to who participates, you can see, um, Director and above is probably your most um, typical breaking point. Um, I'm surprised that not for profit um, is even in there. Um, I minimally see organizations, nonprofits with with a long term incentive plan. Uh, in terms of measures used, um, relative shareholder performance has become really the buzzword, especially in well, obviously in public, because you're looking at relative to other peers in your industry. And generally performance runs similar through industries. You know, like we'll look at the gas price when that spiked and it's going up now, that affects certain industries more than others. Well, that's a huge potential impact on your results, your financial results. So, so that's become very popular for public companies. So this is just an array of who's using what. And then the period of the long-term incentive plan, that performance period, that example I gave before of combining those goals of year one plus year two plus year three, this is the norm. 92% are using a three-year plan. Um, some years ago, uh, it became in fashion to put like a two-year plan in. So it was more than one, but less than three, uh, two. It used to be more in fashion to have a five-year goal. But that, those have really fallen out of favor. So today we're really hunkering around the, the three-year period. And then this slide is exactly the same as the annual one. When I talked about the amount you get paid out at different points, the minimum and the maximum. So I'm not going to spend time on that because we talked about that. So that's my last slide. Um, cool. So, Mike, and you want to shoot a couple of questions out or? Um, sure. I'll try, I'll try one because I know it's only got a couple minutes and you do have a nine o'clock, but uh, there was a question on uh, with with work from home becoming more of the norm uh, or just more prevalent. Um, and then you, know, you hear of companies adjusting for pay if, uh, you know, let's say your job was in New York City, you moved to, you know, Alabama, pay uh, cost of living increases or change as much is great. Um, are companies making those changes uh, for working from where you live? How prevalent is it? Have you, have you seen that? Just That's a questions. great question. That is definitely hitting the news. You know, um, before COVID in, from surveys, about half, I'm sorry, about a third of the companies used geographic differentials. So that means if you're a large enough company that you operate in multiple markets or countries for that matter, you look at the pay in that local market, for example, New York, San Francisco, Boston, are probably 20 or 25% higher pay ranges than, you know, Chicago or, um, and there are a lot, you know, there's very small, a lot lower than national and very rural markets. So some companies find that they will pay differently. Now, it's, it's a, an administrative burden to do that. It's also difficult to keep track of where everybody moves and lives. And, you know, so more companies are asking the question, but I have not seen a lot flip the switch. Some of my client projects right now are, are having me look at that. Should we do this or shouldn't we do this? And I have one who is actually doing it right now who we're going to take it out. Um, one of the reasons was it didn't make sense. They only had a few people on the other side of the higher ranges and it just didn't make sense. 
but um, and it didn't make sense because first of all, they weren't tracking them properly and they um, it was so close and there was like less than 10 people in that set. So it didn't make sense for them. Oh. Um, so no, to answer your question, I don't see a big shift. So I still believe the majority are not using them, although they're asking the question. That's, That's what I've very seen. helpful. Um, there are other questions but I think, uh, as Linda said, I, I highly recommend. So I apologize, everyone, for not getting to those. Um, but, it, I mean, Linda, if you're okay, do you want them to email those? I, I highly yeah, go, go ahead and email them. I'm happy to send a response. And if someone wants to get on the phone with me offline, I'm happy to do that as well. Yeah, so uh, if we send over these slides, as you see, Linda has her contact info there. Please, uh, there was good questions. I apologize for not getting to them. So please email her uh, or try to set up a call. Uh, and Linda, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was great. And thank you for great. offering to answer those questions. Um, yep, it was awesome. And it was obviously a good topic because it had a lot of questions. And I know it's it's probably more than an hour. So, uh, so thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And everyone have a great day.